Let us pray. As we pray, I just want to encourage each one of us to submit to the Lord in the quietness of your heart. Just allow the Lord to reveal himself to you. What are those things that you want to bring to the Lord during this season of fasting? This season of Lent? What is it that you want to declare to the Lord? If the Lord takes a picture of your heart, how will the picture come out? What is it that is going to be revealed if he took that picture of your heart, your heart alone? Is there something that you want to surrender to the Lord today? And just allow the Lord to take it over. The filth of our hearts, the issues of our hearts. The heart is so deceitful and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It's the reason for Lent that you can pour out your heart to the Lord and allow the Lord to overturn the tables of your heart. Allow the Lord to deal with the anger in your life. Allow the Lord to deal with any little bits of sin, any droplets of sin that are there in your heart. Can we surrender them to the Lord and allow the Lord to take over our lives? Any issues of jealousy that have been kept in our hearts, issues of selfishness that we have kept in our hearts, different issues that have hindered the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We want to surrender them to the Lord and allow the Lord to work in us. As we begin this season, it's not just a season to show off. It's not a one-day Lent season. It's not a one-day off that you come here on this ash Wednesday and you go back out with the ashes and yet your heart is not turned. Will you allow the Lord to speak into your life this afternoon? Will you allow the Lord to enter and dine with you? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you only opened your heart, I will come in and I will dine with you. Will you allow the Lord to have a seat? Is there a space for him to sit? Is your heart open for him to have a place of honor? Can he be given the whole territory in your life? Is there a space that you have kept it for yourself? Is it something that, is, that you've hidden from the Lord for ages and you do not want the Lord to see? Father, we are here as your children. For you do not desire our offering, but Lord, the sacrifice of the Lord is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, Lord, you shall never despise. We are here, Lord. Our hearts are broken before you. Lord, we choose to submit to your, to your authority. Tonight, Lord, we choose to submit to your authority. We choose to hear your voice, our God and our Father, for there is none like you. It's only you, Lord, who searches the heart. It's only you, Lord, who weighs the attitudes of our hearts. Yes, Lord, many will look and never see, but Lord, even as we are seated here, you've already seen us. You know us inside out, oh God. There is nothing about us that is hidden from you, our Father. We surrender to you. We surrender to you, Lord. Teach us what it takes to surrender during this Lent season. Lord, we bless your name. Even as I speak, Lord, may your word come with clarity. Lord, may you speak to me, Lord. Rebuke me, correct me. Challenge me, Lord. Help me to choose your path and your path alone. Help me to focus and focus to you alone. We give you praise, glory, and honor. For this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise be to the Lord. We welcome each of you in the presence of the Lord. This is one of those very, very important seasons in the calendar of the church. And we do believe that this season will bring to us, will bring us very close to the Lord. 
We've just gone through the 40 days of prayer and fasting, and the Lord has been working within us. And at this moment, we do believe that we are returning more to the Lord. And we trust that the Lord will continue to work in us and mend our hearts. He tells us in Joel that rend your hearts and not your garments. It is your heart. And Paul talks about circumcise your heart. It's not the flesh, but circumcise your heart. There is something within us that the Lord wants to deal with. There is something within us that the Lord wants to correct so that he can make us the kind of people that he wants us to be. We are talking about the spiritual discipline of fasting. And each one of us has had that moment which you set apart and you say, this time I'm going to focus on the Lord, I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray. And we've just gone through it and many of us were able to take the 40 days, some of us took a few days, but you came at the feet of the Lord. Fasting can be done in different ways. For some people, they can choose the Esther fast, which you go through three days of no water, no food, but just being in the presence of the Lord. Some of us fast while we drink water. Some of us fast while we drink juice. Some of us fast from morning by six, you break your fast and eat something in different ways. Some of us can take the Daniel fast where you do vegetable and water Whichever way the Lord directs you to fast, may God give us the grace to be in his presence. As long as what you are doing, you are not doing it for anyone's glory. You are doing it for the Lord. We've just been reminded in the gospel reading that when you fast, do not put on that somber face so that everyone can see that you are really fasting. Some of us, when we are fasting, it becomes too much. You don't even brush. You know, you move around and everybody knows, you know, the breath is what shows someone that you're fasting. You know, fasting is something you are in the presence of the Lord. Friends, our God is not a miserable God. He's not. And when you're fasting, you are not doing him a service. You are doing it for his glory. And you are doing it to honor God. And therefore, presenting yourself before him in a fast, you are saying, God, I am humbling my life before you, and I pray that you'll hear my voice. It is to his glory and honor that you submit to the Lord in a time of prayer and fasting. Fasting is discouraged, especially for breastfeeding mothers. It is discouraged for those who are on medication. It's discouraged for those who have a, a chronic illnesses, high blood pressure and diabetes and whatever. We need to be very conscious unless if you have medical approval that you need to have this fast. Please don't fast and end up on a hospital bed. You have to be conscious. The Lord gives us wisdom as we go through spiritual disciplines. You don't just go through a spiritual discipline for the sake of doing it. I know for sure you can fast when you are sick, but that has to be a revelation from the Lord. You need to seek the Lord. It's like when you go for, to a fast for 40 days and 40 nights, like Jesus did, you want to emulate Jesus, it has to be special revelation from the Lord. Please don't say we've been pushed into it. It has to be special revelation from the Lord. And you are confident that 40 days and 40 nights, I'm going to fast and I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to drink. It has to be a revelation from the Lord. But we encourage us, fasting is a spiritual discipline that every Christian is meant to practice. It is a spiritual discipline where we empty ourselves before the Lord. In the Old Testament, every national problem was sorted through prayer and fasting. In the Old Testament, there was no distinction between the state and the church. Religion controlled the state. And without relief, someone submitting to the Lord, without the leaders submitting to the Lord, there was no government. 
It is today that we have separated, you know, take away those things of religion. That is, we, we have it today. But that was not the case for the Old Testament. Fasting was mandatory. The king left his seat and came down on the ground as we shall see. There was no distinction between the secular and the sacred like we see now. Don't tell us about those things. And even when we do it, we do it to please I don't know who. It is for the sake of it. God was supreme over every situation and people feared God. Even those who were not Jews feared the God of the Jews. And they declared and they told the Jews, your God is a mighty God. They feared the God of the Jews because this God was pleased when people came down and, pleased, and, and fasted and prayed. The only way to please this God was to turn to him in prayer and fasting. It did not matter. You had to turn to the Lord. Mordecai learned about the trap to kill all the Jews. And when you read in the scripture that we read our first reading, you see Mordecai in a situation which was in dilemma. And you know, when Mordecai heard about it, he immediately turned to himself. He was by himself and he knew the letters had been sent. When you read chapter 3 of Esther verse 13, letters were sent by courier to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. In one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Mordecai heard about this. Mordecai knew he was a Jew. Mordecai knew his people were going to be killed. And he had the information. The letters had been circulated, and no Jew was going to remain. Decree was issued by the king. And Mordecai, you know, friends, there are times when a decree can be issued against your life and you do not know what to do. You cannot run there. You cannot begin to say, I am going to demonstrate on the street. By the way, demonstrating on the street is not a solution to a problem. It's not a solution to a problem. It can't change anything. You can run. You are killed, you are tired, you are panting, but you have done nothing. Demonstration does not change a situation. And I wish Ugandans would understand that trotting on the street and going walking to parliament and walking everywhere cannot change the situation of Uganda. Something else needs to be learned from the word of God. And this is what Mordecai is doing. Mordecai is seeing a national dilemma. And he's looking at it and he's thinking, what am I going to do? The letters have been circulated. And he knows the people that have done it. What Mordecai did, when he learned about it, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth cloth and ashes and went out in the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. This is a cry of a desperate heart. By the fact that he was putting on sackcloth, cloth, he had already put on ashes. He went out and was crying. Crying to who? Crying to God. He's saying we are all dead. We are all beaten. He did not have time to mobilize. But he went, he put on sucker cloth as an individual. He said even if I am alone, I am going to seek the face of the Lord for the people of Israel. He knew where to go. And so Mordecai cried out to the Lord. He, he, he changed his nature. You know, friends, today we are going to put um, the, what we call the imposition of ashes. And some of us uh, have, have, um, as, as have come here simply because you want the imposition of ashes. Yes, you are going to receive the imposition of ashes. That is a reminder to you of what ashes mean. The ashes are a symbol of sorrow. 
It is sorrow. You are not just going to receive it so that someone sees that you have received it. It has to translate into your heart to remind you that your heart is sorrowful about what is going on in your life. Your heart is sorrowful about the pain that the world is going through. Your heart is sorrowful about your own personal sin that is in your heart. That is the reason for those ashes. It's not just a mark. It is a reason, and we mark it with a cross, telling you that the sorrow that you have, the pain that you have, can only be surrendered to the cross of Jesus. And we pray that that sign of ashes will be able to remind you wherever you go to say, yes, I need to turn to the Lord. So Mordecai tore his robes, he put on ashes, he went out into the city, he started crying out to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord. Friends, when you read the scriptures, you discover quite a number of people that were able to put on the ashes. When you look at the king of Nineveh, in Jonah 3, chapter, Jonah chapter 3, verse 8, the king of Nineveh, when Jonah finally arrives in Nineveh and tells the king of Nineveh that this city is going to be destroyed because you have sinned against God, the first thing the king of Nineveh, he does not complain, he does not ask Don Jonah, what have we done? He does not ask question. He knew they had sinned against God. The king of Nineveh put off his robes and put them down and put on sackcloth and put on ashes and commanded, passed a decree in the hall of Nineveh and he told all of them, including the animals and the birds, they fasted for three days without drinking, without eating. There are certain things that require a national leader or a leader of an institution to stand out and put their knees down before something changes. There are things that will not change until the leadership chooses to change. And when the leadership changes, then everybody has no choice but to change. Nineveh, we are told that when Nineveh turned away, from the, turned away from evil to the Lord, that regime, that righteousness persisted for over 100 years. Praise the Lord. When the king turns their heart to the Lord, things change. Friends, that is why we teach the Christians to say, you are Ugandans when it is voting, vote a Christian. Because things will not change. Things will not change. Until you have a Christian who knows that they can put their knees down and cry out to the living God. It is high time that the Christians understood that the God of other people is not the Christian God. Your God is a unique God. He does not subscribe to any other. Your God can never be a Hindu God. Your God cannot be an Islamic God. You cannot say my God is the same as Allah. After all, we worship the same God. It is impossible. You have the God of heaven, the creator of the universe. The rest have small gods with a small G. You can never. Yes. However good they are, they still have a dilemma. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to heaven except through our God. Hallelujah. So Nineveh remained faithful to the Lord for a hundred years. Daniel in chapter 9 from verse 3 Daniel looks at the situation of the children of Israel. They have been in this captivity and the years that were supposed to go back, back home, the years have ended. And Daniel said, why are the Jews still in captivity? What do we do? 
Daniel said, I turned my face to the Lord, seeking him in prayer and pleas for mercy with the fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And that is how he cried to the Lord. Because he knew there is something that has gone wrong that must be corrected for the Lord to do something about this issue. He cried out to the Lord. Friends, we are going to have to cry out to the Lord if certain things must change. You cannot begin to come here and you cry out to the Lord and tomorrow you are in a shrine and you think something will change. It will never. God is a jealous God and he will remain jealous forever. He does not operate in your heart and also operate in a shrine. Never. It's not possible. You move from here and you are out there, you are compromising. And you say, you know, it is okay. I will repent. For how long are you going to fool God? You can't. You can't make him a fool. You can't make him a liar. You either submit to him or you do not. That is it. King Ahab had the same scenario in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 27. And when Ahab heard these words, he tore his robes and put on sackcloth on his flesh and he fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. Now we all know Ahab, the husband to Jezebel. They had just killed Naboth. And the judgment comes to Ahab. Friends, that is a situation you say, but God, didn't you know that really these people killed the, uh, Naboth? But because Ahab submitted to the Lord, the Lord, word of the Lord came to him and said, now that you have humbled yourself, the sin, the, 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 the problem which was going to come on you shall not befall you during this generation. It changed. Why? He humbled himself. But how did Jezebel die? Jezebel, who never humbled, the, the truth came to pass. She was thrown out of the window, but by the time she reached, reached she, the people went to check. It was only the skull. Because of the evil that she had done. Friends, there is judgment. There is judgment. If you want to turn to the Lord, this is the time for you to turn to the Lord. If you do not want to turn to the Lord, it is well with your soul. It is your life. It is your life. So God is calling us to turn to him. And the people that turned to him, the Lord was able to show mercy. There are many more examples of men and women who humbled themselves before the Lord seeking for mercy. Putting off is a sign of humility. Falling down on the ground, staying without food, crying bitterly to none but God. Mordecai walked to the palace in his sackcloth. Now you don't go to the palace, palace when you are not fully dressed. You don't. My first time to go to Kasubi Tombs. <laughs> we went there as a team of students of African traditional religion, going to, to find out how African traditional religion operates. And I reached there, and I had my skirt with a slit. And as we approached the shrine, this man with a spear stands behind me <laughs> and tells me in Luganda, Teba kuna mirakabaka. You know? Yes. You, 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 you understand the humility, how you go. But now you look at Mordecai. He's walking to the king's palace. And he's going there in sackcloth. Why? There is trouble and it is spiritual. Yes, I am going to go in my sackcloth. Because there is trouble. When the situation gets tough, you are only focused on salvation. You walk to dangerous places without caring. You do not know. You know, friends, time comes when your life is surrendered. Whether I perish, let me perish. There is something that must change. Friends, in Uganda, we need people that are going to say, whether I perish, let me perish. 
but something must change. This man went. He went to the palace. Things were dangerous. But he went to the palace. Two weeks ago, we were burying, um, buried my auntie, and one of his sons stood up and said, our mother was a hero. And he cited an example. He said that in 1973, my father was arrested and allegedly taken to prison. To prison, and they alleged a uh, treason. They, 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 I mean, so so the mother left and went out and said, "I'm going to meet the president Amin and tell him my husband is innocent." And they told her. You are going to die before your husband dies. And she walked and went to the president and reached President Amin and told him, my husband is innocent. And Amin wondered about a woman who never fears him. He ordered the man to be released immediately. Friends, there are times when courage is required for change to happen. It is tough. But Christians, we need to stand. We need to stand and know that there is a need for us to be committed to face our God with the total commitment. In most cases, we lack the kind of corporate attention to matters that are very urgent. Some of us will say, let us now come together and pray. Another will say, those ones are just joking. Let them keep praying. They will see what will happen. We are divided and the division hinders the power of God. Division. The Christians are so divided. So divided. That there is nothing that can move. You move with a Christian and you think you are moving with a Christian. And yet you are moving with a total betrayer. They have nothing to do with your agenda. And yet on the first value, they are Christians. But within them, there is totally nothing Christian. May God have mercy on us. The issues of importance require corporate attention. In marriage, this thing happens. You have something as a family that requires family attention. As one is really groaning in prayer, another one is snoring. And then they wake up dozing and say, why are you shouting for me? Matters of urgency that require the two of you to be awake. And seek the face of the Lord. But you are just snoring. Day and night you are snoring. And the problem is escalating. And you are snoring. Christians stop snoring. We need to wake up and seek the face of the Lord. By the way, you don't only snore at night. Even at the office. Even during the day. You are just there. You don't know. Something is something of urgency and importance. You snore in it. I want to pray that God will wake us up. In prayer and fasting, one of the things that we see here, in prayer and fasting, you need to have facts. You know, look at this gentleman. Verse 6. Now Esther has sent his, her, 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 her men to go and find out from Mordecai. Verse 6 of chapter 4. Hattak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him. And the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for the their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king. You know, he had facts. You know, sometimes we want to pray, but what are you praying for? 
You don't even seek the Lord to understand how to pray. You are just praying and you don't know what you're praying for. You know, it's like you are shooting a bullet and you are saying, if it catches a thief, if it catches a thief, where will you catch the thief? Doesn't a thief see the bullets? You know, this is wow. Prayer requires you to understand in prayer and fasting, you must have the facts. You must know. That is why we say you do spiritual mapping. Understand your family. What is your family tree? What are the problems? What are the foundational issues? How are you supposed to pray? That is need to know. You know, there are many times that I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I want you to show me this person. I know uh, someone can tell you this person has these issues. You don't just go to the person and begin praying. You need to seek the Lord to show you that person. And friends, God is so faithful. God will show you that person. And you will know who they are. God has ways of revealing what the person is. One day I lost my keys, some time back, not here. <laughs> I lost my keys of the office. And after losing my keys, I started getting so many issues. And the, in my spirit, I thought someone could have just picked these keys. I went to the Lord and I said, God, you're going to have to show me where these keys are. One day I was sleeping. In a dream, I was in the house and I saw someone coming, holding my keys, coming to me in great anger. And as, and as she approached the door, I closed the door and started praying. And I woke up from sleep. I knew where my keys were. I did not have to approach the person. But I had to report the person to the Lord in prayer. Because I knew where the problem was. Friends, learn to go to the Lord and let the Lord reveal issues to you. It was going to depend on your commitment to prayer. Don't just throw bullets aimlessly without knowing you box the air and you don't know where you are boxing. Have a target as you pray. And seek the Lord, and the Lord will be able to reveal himself to you. Ask the Lord, and the Lord is able. The Lord can do it. So may God give us the grace to be able to know what to do. Dr. Dixon Oboya on Sunday said prayer is work. Prayer is not for the lazy people. <laughs> when you are lazy, you can never pray. Prayer is for those that are core, <laughs> who are determined to fight and to wrestle with the enemy. It is wrestling with the enemy. It is not just saying, Satan, eh? Satan, you go to sleep. Eh? No, he doesn't get silent like that. You wrestle with the evil one, and you have to wrestle in prayer. Ask the Lord to remind you why you are where you are at such a time as this. This is the situation that befalls Mordecai. Mordecai told them, replied to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from, for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows? whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows? Why are you placed where you are? You know, sometimes you are in this particular office and you are struggling with A, B, C, D and you never sit back to ask God, why am I here? How I pray that you are going to ask the Lord why you are there. Actually, when you ask the Lord, you might be fired. And when you are fired, you say, thank you, Lord, I've finished my work. You walk away smartly and very happily, no crying, because you know why you are there. Why has the Lord positioned you where you are? And what are you doing for the Lord? It might be you are volunteering. It might be you are, you are the manager. 
it might be you are the CEO there, it might be you are earning so much money, ask the Lord, why are you giving me this so much money at such a time as this? And because you don't ask the Lord, that is why someone stands and says, I actually have money, but I don't know what to use it for. Because you've not sought the Lord why you are there. It is possible that that's the only season you will ever earn money. There is no other season that you will ever earn money. But you put fuel in your car and you drive to Kasese and then you drive to Kabale and then you drive to Kenya and then you go to Nairobi and then at the end of the day God tells you your season is over and you are still renting. There is a season that God places you in a place for a particular reason. And that season is going to expire. And when it expires, what accountability do you have to give back to the Lord? You may not have accountability to give back to the Lord. But you need to give back to the Lord accountability. Finally, obedience is key when you are fasting. Verse 17, Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. He went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, during this Lent season, there are things that the Lord is going to have to instruct you to do. And if the Lord gives you instructions, will you obey? Or will you say, this thing is too hard for me, I can't do it? I pray that God will give us the grace. What is it that the Lord is telling us to do? In Psalm 51, we realize that when David was rebuked for his sin of adultery, he immediately repented. He immediately turned to the Lord. Fasting is about total surrender. It's about self-giving. We saw in the gospel reading that we read that beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For you will have, for then you will have no reward from your father. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet, because as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. There are things that the Lord is going to have to instruct you to do. God, Lord, can instruct you to give something to someone. Are you going to do it? But he's saying, you know, when you do it, don't sound a trumpet. Don't sound a trumpet. You give and then you begin following. Where is my money? Where did you put it? Where is my money? You gave it to the Lord. Where is my Money. May God give us the grace. The Lord will instruct you. He says when you do it, when you give, give to the needy and sound no trumpet. Friends, some of us have seen the blessings of people that give and have nothing to do with their giving. They give to the Lord and sigh and they keep quiet. They give to the Lord and allow that money to do the work of the Lord. This morning I was sharing with a team of people and I was telling them, you know what? My postgraduate studies were on a scholarship of someone who gave. I will never get to know them, not even a single day. But they impacted the kind of woman that I am today. They are not even aware of where their money went. This season, we want to give you an opportunity. Every Wednesday, we want to give you an opportunity to give a special offer to someone that you do not know. And that someone can be blessed through your giving and you don't know them. You don't know them. The white person who gave my scholarship might have died. But how many people have benefited from the word of God that I'm preaching today? How many souls have turned to Christ? And yet I've never gone to kneel to that person and say, thank you for educating me. Friends, you can do something. You can bless someone during this Lent season. You can purpose to bless someone without requiring a thank you. 
and a person will be blessed through your giving. And we want to give you that opportunity to do that so that you can be able to bless someone during this Lent season. It's about resurrecting a dead situation. That is what Lent is all about. This Lent season, we want our, to, to, to surrender our lives to the Lord and say, God, there is a situation that had died in me. I pray that this situation will rise up again because you are my God. We're going to stand and just take a minute in prayer. Let's just stand. I do not know what your fears are as you come to this season of Lent. I just want to encourage you to open your heart to the Lord. There could be one or two things that you've heard that have touched your life. Bring, make that uh, your prayer and make it a personalized prayer. Maybe there is a fear. Maybe the Lord is sending you to do something, but there is a fear. Maybe you have not fully surrendered to the Lord. Maybe you have your legs, one here and one the other side, and there is no answer that is coming. Maybe you were family, but you are not in agreement. Each one is doing their own thing. Pray that the Lord will bring unity in that family. Maybe you've never offered your heart to do something for someone somewhere. Maybe there is someone that has consistently, like that persistent widow who kept knocking at the judge's um, door until the judge said, although I do not fear God, let me do it for this widow. Maybe there's something the Lord is knocking at your heart and asking you to do. And is reminding you during this Lent season and is saying, my son, my daughter, this is my plea to you. Maybe there is a situation you have been praying, but you have been praying random prayers without even thinking. I want you today to seek the face of the Lord and say, Lord, show me this situation. Show me where the problem is. Show me what is haunting me. Come to the Lord and say, Lord, today I want to see what you are doing in my life. What is this that I've been facing all the time? Maybe you are in a particular office and the Lord has sent you there for a reason and for a purpose. But you have wasted your life. You have wasted the resources. The Lord has given you money. You have wasted money. You have even stolen more. And yet you are still there. You are a nuisance in that place. The Lord wants to change your life today. Just surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, from today I just want to know why you have placed me where I am. I just want to surrender to you. Surrender your life to the Lord and allow the Lord to work in you during this Lent season. Allow the Lord to plant a new seed in your life. You've been praying for something. Ask the Lord, have I totally surrendered to him? Is there something that I have kept for myself? And you just want to say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. Friends, surrender to the Lord. Surrender to the Lord. Just give it all to the Lord. Give it all to the Lord. Allow the Lord to search your heart. The Lord does not desire a just a sacrifice, but an open, a broken, a contrite heart. He will not despise.